Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Smith. I'm the host for Steve Barlow, and I have the pleasure of introducing everybody, introducing him to you. Um, Steve Barlow. Steve Barlow is an industry recognized leader in information management and and quality improvement. He got his bachelor's in health education and promotion at the University of Utah, and he began his career 25 years ago at Intermountain Healthcare, where he helped develop the analytical capabilities that have helped him become an industry leader in outcome improvement and cost optimization. Eight years ago, he left there um, to start Health, Health Catalysts, where he helps provide organizations nationwide develop those same capabilities. Um, he's also a founding member and, and former chair of the Healthcare uh, Data Warehousing Association. Uh, last year, he, Ernst & Young, uh, awarded him Entrepreneur of the Year for uh, Utah. And in his spare time, he likes to, he likes to go cycling, hiking. Uh, he bakes bread and spends time with his family. So uh, everybody, see Barlow. Test. Thank you, Chris. It's great to be here, and I thought it was a wise move to put the raffle at the end so we can keep you here. <laughs> Between ice cream and you is me, and so I'll try to get through this. Um, and then we'll leave, we'll leave about 15 minutes at the end for questions, and would love and welcome your questions, and we'll do our best to answer those. So I'm going to I'm going to today talk a little bit about the softer side of data analytics and uh, data. There's a lot of rough edges around and sharp corners with data when we talk about bits and bytes, but I'm going to talk a little bit about this, the soft underbelly. And uh, I want to start by telling you a story. Have any of you heard of Ignaz Semmelweis? Wow, there are a few. That's great. He is one of my heroes. So Ignaz uh, was born in Hungary. He's an obstetrician uh, in the 19, early 19th century, mid-19th century. And he is known for his work around antiseptic. So here's the story. There were two clinics in Vienna. He was practicing in uh, the General Hospital of Vienna. Two clinics. One clinic taught medical students and the other clinic taught midwives. The one clinic that taught the medical students had a maternal mortality rate uh, th over four times the rate this, the other clinic did. So mothers heard about this and were petrified to deliver their child in this clinic. So much so that they would get down on their knees and beg to be admitted to the other hospital, the other clinic these mothers would even prefer to deliver their babies in the street before delivering their babies in this other clinic because they, they knew it was going to be a death wish. They were going to go there and get purple or fever or childbed fever and die. So Ignaz, this bothered him incessantly. He couldn't sleep. He couldn't eat. He tried everything. He tried to make these two clinics, reduce variation among these two clinics as much as possible. Eliminate all the variables so they're exactly the same. Even religious rites and practices in the two clinics were made the same. Um, but still, the maternal mortality rate did not go down after all of his efforts. Finally, a good buddy of his got pricked. So the clinic that taught the medical students at the basement of this clinic, they housed cadavers. And a good buddy, peer obstetrician of his got pricked by medical student scalpel after working on a cadaver. He acquired childbed fever and died. This was another data point that he could use to understand what in the world was causing these deaths and the higher mortality rate. So he decided, he came up with a hypothesis. The hypothesis was that medical students contaminate their hands working on the cadavers. This is, remember, this is before germ theory and Louis Pasteur. This is way before that. 
So he thought, okay, these medical students are working on these cadavers in the basement and then go and deliver babies and are infecting the mothers. That was his hypothesis. So he said, let's have the medical students and the physicians, before they go deliver a baby and treat a patient, wash their hands with a lime chlorine solution. Takes care of this, the stench that they have on their hands from the cadaver work, and it'll maybe kill some kind of a contaminant. Well, he did that, and this is what happened. So you can see the rate, the uh, mortality, maternal mortality rate back from 1841 to 1847 here, and it's all over the board. Tons of variation. He implements the chlorine hand wash right here in May of 1847, and the rate drops overnight. So beforehand, it was up near 20%, 20% mortality rate. After implementing the, the wash, it drops down to 2% in that clinic. Actually lower than the other clinic. So then they instituted the hand wash in the other clinic and the, mort and the mortality rates dropped. This is a little bit of a ma more of a macro view of things. So prior to the hand wash, you, s you see the, the rates. This is the, the clinic with the medical students, the pink. This is the, the clinic with the midwives. Midwives don't work with cadavers. That's why the clinic, um, of the, the second clinic, the blue clinic, didn't have the rates as high as the, as the first clinic. Institute the hand wash, and the rates go down to virtually zero. But what happened? The rates climbed back up over time. Ignace was absolutely persecuted for his theory by peer clinicians. They thought, how dare he say that I'm the reason for infecting these mothers and I have to wash my hands after working on cadavers. Ignace actually ended up dying in an asylum. Be even his wife turned against him and thought he was insane. He was beaten and ironically died of septicemia. Septicemia is a systemic infection of your body. Your, uh, your organs shut down and you die of infection. Because he could not convince his peers and the medical establishment of the importance of this. They had data. He, he had very good data to support all of these activities, but the doc still wouldn't change their ways. Tragic ending for Ignace. Today, he's recognized as the savior of mothers and memorialized on, on the euro coin, 50 euro. So two statements I want to consider today. The first is do good with data. We talk so much about big data and the, what we can learn from data. We need to use data for really good purposes. There are certainly other purposes we need to use data to protect ourselves, but do good with data. Second is, data is necessary, but it is not sufficient. It is not the silver bullet to solve world hunger. And we're going to talk about that. So quick story. This gives you a little bit of context about what has motivated me in my career. I worked at Intermountain. The first da analytic data set that we worked on was diabetes. We, we defined the diabetic population, and then we were going to track how well we were managing that population of diabetic patients. So... That was my first project. Two years out of college, diving in, building this database. We released the database. The Intermountain also has a health plan. So they're both a payer and a provider organization. The payer organization said, hey, good idea. We can use, you've defined our population of diabetics. We can send them a note. Those patients who don't have their A1C, haven't had their A1C tested. A1C is a test that makes it so you cannot lie on your blood glucose. If I'm a diabetic and I'm going to go see the doc, I take my finger prick, I can kind of fudge it. I can say, okay, I'm not going to eat any sugar and ice cream for the next 24 hours and the doc will think I'm doing good. A1C, you can't do that. A1C is a test that takes a, a three-month average. So you can't lie about it. It's a really good measure. Well, with that, we said, okay, we're going to send those diabetics who haven't had an A1C done in the last... 12 months, we're going to send them a reminder. 
And that came out of my database that I built with, with my team. Well, two weeks after we released this and the health plan started using it, I go home to visit mom. Mom's a diabetic. And there on the countertop is this sheet that came out of my database that says, hey, it looks like you haven't had your A1C tested in the last 12 months. Maybe make an appointment with your physician. We can do great things with data. We can save lives. We can save money. Quick note, um, Dartmouth did a study. They did it for two years running. And in that study, they said if everyone practiced health care, like Intermountain Healthcare, Geisinger, Mayo, Johns Hopkins, we could easily cut out 30% of our health care costs in the country just by focusing on quality. We can do good things with data. A few more stories. These are some projects that our teams have worked on with our clients. 22% reduction in septicemia. Mortality rates related to septicemia. Remember, septicemia is a systemic infection. All your organs shut down and you die. That estimated uh, saving about 225 lives a year at just this one client by using information and improvement methodologies to improve the care that we and safer care that we deliver. That, that resulted in, in $1.3 million in savings just in that one client in that one population, small population of patients. Another one, asthma. So we work with this children's hospital and we sit down in this room with these docs and they say, you know what, we, I'm sure we are only, um, we are only ordering x-rays on 10% of our pediatric patients. You don't need to x-ray asthma, pediatric asthma patients every time they present with asthma and subject them to those harmful radiations from an x-ray. That's the standard. It's written in the literature. It's, ex it's medically accepted as the right best practice. X-ray pediatric patients with asthma 10% of the time. We showed them the data in the first meeting. They hadn't looked at their data yet. In the first meeting, we show them the data. They were doing it over 60% of the time, subjecting these pediatric patients to harmful radiation. Overnight, they changed their order set and dropped that down to less than 10% of the time with the help of data. Another one with women and newborn. So the, the data shows and the studies show that you should not electively induce a pregnant mother to deliver the baby, electively, not for medical cause, electively before 39 weeks gestation. Almost every client that we work with knows those studies. Almost every client we work with doesn't do that all the time. So we show them the data. We don't ever do that. We know the studies. We don't do that. Well, no, they do it 15, 20 percent of the time. And the reason they do it is because it's convenient for the provider, the physician. I'm going to head down to Cabo next week, and I really want to be here for your delivery. Why don't we go ahead and induce you? Or the mother says, I'm really tired of carrying this child. Can we go ahead and induce it? And I'd love to have my baby now. Well, that's not good. If you do it before 39 weeks gestation, your risk of cesarean, urgent cesarean goes up, your NICU days go up, um, other costly and debilitating complications result. So we work with our clients and say, okay, let's not do that. And we show them how to do it right, show them the data, walk them through, and we reduce it from 15 to 20% down to 2% with them. That's what we mean when we say let's do good with data. And it, data is necessary, but it is not the whole answer. So I want to talk a little bit about Deming. You've seen this before, I'm sure, Deming's uh, profound knowledge cycle. The need to have knowledge, to understand variation, uh, psychology, early adopters, diffusion at Rogers diffusion theory. And there needs to be an appreciation for a system and how to manage that system and the processes within a system. The way we see data is, is one of three really key systems to improve outcomes in healthcare. And this could be transferable to other industries, certainly, and has been. Healthcare actually is way late in the game from a quality improvement perspective. So the first system is 
this idea of analytics. We need to have data to understand how are we doing today. How are we doing? We need data systems from various data sources in an analytic data set that we can study to understand how we're doing. We need to understand what should we be doing. What does the literature say? What is our experience? Why does one doctor have really good outcomes versus another? What, should, what is the right way to do it? The literature, what's the best practice? We need to understand what should we be doing. And then finally, how do we get everyone to do it this way all the time? Use the data, use the best practice, and get all the doctors to do it the right way every time in every facility. There needs to be this adoption methodology to drive that change. This is all these three systems interplay together and really are a means to the greater end of improving outcomes. That's what our organization is all about. If we just focus on one of these, this is kind of interesting. So if we just say we're going to just focus, we're going to be an analytics company. And we're going to drive outcomes improvement just by presenting to these hospitals data. Well, you can do that, but you end up being this information-centric organization that is, if you build it, they will come. We can show them all kinds of great dashboards and scorecards and business intelligence artifacts, but that's it. And that doesn't always change behavior and sustain gains. Alternatively, we can just focus on being a research center. What is the best way to treat heart failure? What is the best way to treat asthma? What is the best way to treat diabetes? But we never get traction on that if we just focus on defining the best practice. We need to drive change. Likewise, if we're adopt just focusing on here's how we're going to motivate everyone to change, but it's not supported by these other two systems, we end up being a motivational speaker and, and driving a, a flavor of the month. We don't have any any data to support what we're doing. So we need all three of those systems to drive and improve outcomes. So I want to I want to now dive into each of those three circles just briefly and just describe what's contained in there and how it affects and and uh, influences improvement. The first one is defining the best practice. Historically, it takes decades and years to identify and learn, here's the best way to treat a heart failure patient. If we go back to Ignaz Semmelweis, it took 25 years after his death, his painful death, for germ theory to sprout and him to be recognized, you know what, that's the right way to do it. We should be washing our hands after we touch cadavers and go deliver babies. 25 years to do that to come to, to, for that to be a best practice. We need, we don't have time to do that today. We need to drive these changes and drive that time to, from knowledge acquisition to consistent practice to weeks and months, not years and decades. That's, that's the symptom of a strong best practice system. An organization that understands how to define best practice and then deploy it very quickly. The first step you need to do for the, in this process is to define the population. So if we go back to this diabetic example I shared with you about my mom, the first thing we had to do is define, okay, who are we going to, going to include in this population of diabetics? Well, there's a lot of ways to define diabetes. And, and what we have here are different ways to define ICD-9 procedure codes, ICD-9 diagnosis codes. There are supplemental related codes like glucose out of control. There are problems that doctors note on a person's medical record saying this person has diabetes based on my observation. That's irrespective of the diagnosis and procedure codes. And then medications, we can infer a diagnosis based on the medications prescribed by the doctor. If I'm on some insulin controller, I can presume that this patient has diabetes. Well, the, the systems today, historically, have just focused on these coded data elements. What we need to do is create a precise patient registry to define the population and combine and get the entire picture. So if we just looked at diagnosis codes, we'd only be finding 29,000 of these diabetics. 
by looking at these other elements, these other pieces of information, and there are more data inputs coming down the pipe in this whole big data revolution. Patient reported outcomes. I can be a, a diabetic patient with a Fitbit or some other wearable device, and I can send um, through social media these data to a repository to give us a more clear picture and better define this population of diabetic patients. So there's a lot of inputs into the defining the data set. Once we've defined that population, we then need to map out what the right process is. That, well, this is how you treat a diabetic patient. They have to have their A1C test done annually. They need their lipid profile done annually. And so we then flow. These are just samples of different flow diagrams, value stream maps that we have built around certain populations. And then we have to have some kind of a plan, define an aim. So the first thing, we're, we've defined the population. We know how they should be treated. We're not doing really well. We have these storm clouds over here. We're not doing really well in this one area. We need to make sure our diabetics get this letter every quarter to remind them to get their A1C test done. And that's our aim or our goal. And then we get that one nailed down and we move on to the next aim and goal and just keep rinsing and repeating. It, it doesn't end. Quality is never done. Quality improvement is an ongoing process. All right, quick, a quick fun exercise. So I'm going to give you 20 seconds, and I want you to find as many numbers in order. So count from 1 to 50 and get as many numbers as you can counting 1 to 50, okay, in 20 seconds. On your mark, get set, go. Ten seconds. Okay, stop. All right, how many got to 25? Really? You win the prize. Two of you? I don't think anyone has ever gotten above 15. So way to go. So any, how many got above 20? 15? 10, 5, okay, typically that's what we see. All right, we're going to do this again. I'm going to give you another chance, okay? Again, count as many numbers as you can from 1 to 50 in 20 seconds. On your mark, oh, let me just show you this. That, by the way, was not a 3. That was a 38, and that's the 3 right over here, so... You may have not made, made it as far as you thought you did. All right, we're going to do it again. Mark, get set, go. Ten seconds. Stop. All right, how many got to 25 this time? 20? 15? 10? Great. All right, we're going to do this one more time. On your mark. There's 53, by the way. That we just threw that in there. It, we only wanted you to go to 1 to 50. And, and I think there's, we're missing an 11 here. Yeah. So we tripped you up there. All right, next one. On your mark, get set, go. Anybody need more time? Okay, so what's the point? Yeah, organization matters. This exercise illustrates chaos, and it illustrates what we're dealing with in, in the context of information and data in healthcare and what we're dealing with from a variation perspective of processes, clinical processes. We need to map out, this is, and some people call it cookbook medicine, but I think we're moving past that. We need to map out, this is the model for taking care of a heart failure patient. These are the metrics that you need to be paying attention to. Right now, we have, this, this next example will illustrate that, my, my next point. 
Who has seen one of these in the back of the seat pa pocket of an airplane? Thumbing through the magazine, you've seen one of these. Best doctors in New York, best doctors in Chicago. Why don't we see these? Military, Captain Von Rick, Richter Finn, Captain John Glenn. We don't see these because of this. The airline industry, now granted, a Boeing 747 is, every Boeing 747 is pretty much the same as every other Boeing 747. Every human being is not the same as every other human being. I get that. But there are things that need to be standardized. The airline industry has moved toward a system of production. There's a very tight checklist that every pilot and co-pilot go through before every flight. And they have prepared for every possible scenario. We are clear back here in the healthcare industry on this spectrum from a craftsmanship kind of a guild system to a system of production like Deming brought to Japan and, and then back to the US. We are clear back here in healthcare. Depending on what physician you see will determine the outcomes you have. End of story. That's just the way it is. How much you'll pay and the quality of the outcome. And that's exacerbated and certainly pronounced more in certain con with certain conditions. We believe strongly that healthcare needs to move up this scale to become more of a system of production. Standardizing processes, using information to determine what the best practice is and then driving that adoption. This is an example of a strong adoption system. So remember a strong best practice system was reducing the time from knowledge discovery to implementation consistently. A strong adoption system is one where we identify, we start with a baseline and performance is low. We implement an intervention to improve, we identify the aim of getting diabetics tested, their A1C tested every year, and then we see performance improve, and we sustain those gains in perpetuity. We build the system in such a way that we don't gravitate back to the previous mean. We sustain those gains. A weak deployment system or adoption system is one where we, and lean, if you've heard of lean and some of these other process improvement models where you, you have a SWAT team that lands and fixes a problem and leaves. This is classic what happens. They, they land, they fix the problem, and it gravitates back to the former main. That's what we don't want to have happen. And that's what's happening, happening way too often in the, in the quality improvement industry in, in healthcare. So this is what we want. We need, from an adoption perspective, to get for Ignaz Semmelweis to get all of his peers and clinicians on board with this hand washing idea. He had data, he just didn't have a methodology to get their hearts and minds. And Simon Sinek has done tremendous work around defining the why. He talks a lot about organizations that have lasted and, and grown and flourished, and that's because they sell the why. People buy what, what you believe and why you do it, not what you build. If you, if you have a chance, if you haven't seen Simon Sinek's um, TED Talk, I encourage you to take a look at his TED Talk. It's great. We need in healthcare to win the hearts and minds of physicians, the care providers, of administrators. It's not just giving them data and hoping that behavior is going to change. We have to help them go through the process. Data is an important part. There are a couple of approaches we can take. The first approach is punishing the outliers. We call that rank and spank or sort and shoot, right? This is the best physician down to the worst physician. The bottom 10%, you're gone. Not a good model long term. We need our good clinicians and clinicians are, mi are quality minded. They want to do what's right. They're also data driven. They're also incredibly competitive. So one way is if you look at a normal distribution from the mean is right here and mediocre outcomes, we're, looking, we're measuring how 
those outcomes are, mortality rates, safety rates, whatever they are, outcomes, financial outcomes. If you look at a normal distribution, the rank and spank or the punitive approach, punish the outliers approach, let's just identify the top, the bottom 10% and get rid of them and just reward these folks here in the middle or on the right with excellent outcomes. ROI there is not great. We believe a better approach is let's shift that entire curve, make it tighter, and shift the mean over toward more excellent outcomes consistently, not just cutting off the outliers. This is a much better approach. This is the approach that the clinicians learned in med school. This is how they want to practice medicine. So then what we do is, okay, if that's the methodology, then where do we begin? How do we know where to start? Well, let's look at clinical processes and let's identify variation in those processes. Why is it that I, I, if I get my hip replaced, I go to one hospital and I pay X and I stay three days in the hospital. I go to another hospital, that same patient, so I'm same severity of illness, different hospital, I pay X times 0.5, and I stay longer in the hospital. Why? Why is there that variation? So we look at, we want to focus in terms, we do a Pareto analysis and we say, okay, let's find those big clinical processes where there's a lot of variation. The, the distribution is pretty varied, pretty wide. It's not tight. And, and or the next best place to start is those that have big, there's a big number of procedures, hip replacements, joint re other joint replacements, that's a big hitter, heart failure, and there's less variation, the, the curve is tighter. These are the two areas where we want to focus our improvement efforts first. So that's where we want to start, and we actually do that with our clients. We plot their clinical processes. Each bubble here represents a different clinical process. So here we've got um, normal labor and delivery, gynecological surgery, um, septicemia we talked about, bowel disorders, joint replacements. The size of the bubble means how big the process is, the volume of the process, how many of these deliveries are we doing a year in this organization. Its placement on the x-axis is um, how large from a direct cost perspective. Its placement on the y-axis is how much variation is in that bubble. Variation in cost, variation in quality. And we measure that using the coefficient of variation, a statistical measure. So the idea here is let's pick big bubbles that are high, high on the y-axis and far to the right. That's our good a good place to start. This organization, by the way, chose this joint replacement um, they did an improvement project around joint replacements. This bubble used to be up here. And they, they put a project in place to reduce variation. Define a standard work, do it that way every time, and we have better outcomes. And we reduce the variation. And they drop the variation down on the y-axis. So let's just drill in now to one of those bubbles. If we take Dr. J, and this is looking at cost per case for vascular procedures. So vein, vein and artery procedures. Dr. J has an average cost per case of $15,000. And he had 15 cases, sorry, $60,000. 15 cases at $60,000 on average. If you expand the population of all docs for that same um, procedure, vascular procedures, the mean cost per case for all docs is actually only 20000 so if we can then work with Dr. J and get her or him to just get the average cost per case down to the mean of $20,000, we have for those 15 cases an opportunity of $600,000 savings. We just need to bring Dr. J down to the mean. That's all. Well, if we look at all of the other docs, every bubble in this chart represents a different doc. The size of bubble means how many vascular procedures she or he does. And you can see the variation. Every one of them has a different mean average cost per case. If we can get all 
of those. And, and let's ignore these three outliers for now. Let's just look at those that are above the mean. And if we can get, that's 25 cases. If, if we can have them get down to the mean, we have an $875,000 opportunity just for this one severity of illness and one procedure. And then if we can get everyone to come down to the mean, we put in a, a, a best practice that everyone can adopt, we have a, a nearly $4 million opportunity with this one population of patients that are like illness. So healthcare evaluates how sick you are and, and puts a score on how sick you are and then classifies you and, and measures you with others who are sick about the same as you. That's what we're talking about here. We see this kind of variation everywhere we go in every clinical process. This is the problem with healthcare. This is what we mean by eliminating 30% of waste out of the system and reducing cost. What you're seeing here is, is variation in labor and delivery. And every color and swim lane represents a different severity. Those who are less sick have fewer other illnesses are down here in the red and green. Those who are really sick and have maybe their diabetes, their diabetic and other comorbid conditions, they're all measured the same, but in every severity of illness, we have this kind of variation. Not only in cost, but also in quality of outcomes. This is what we're trying to fix. That's adoption. I'm gonna hustle through some of these slides in the interest of time. Analytics is the next system, the last system we need a way to measure how we're doing today so we can compare that to what we're doing. A weak system is one where the analysts in an organization, maybe they're masters prepared statisticians who spent their educational career learning how to glean insight out of data. We see this all over the place. They spend the vast majority of their time hunting, gathering, compiling, making data consumable and very little of their time interpreting data, which is what they were trained to do. We want to flip that on its side and create strong analytic systems where they're spending the vast majority of their time interpreting data. The data are gathered quickly, made usable, and they can then discover new knowledge. This is a fun cartoon. I told you I wasn't a gather hunter-gatherer. I'm an analyst. Too often we find too many hunters and gatherers who would rather, much rather be analysts. Um, this distribution of information consumers needs to change. This is the typical, across industries, this is the typical distribution. You have information consumers who are spending, a, a large number of them who are spending their time just viewing a report. They have an email, a report email to them and they just consume, their interactivity is very passive, very brief. There's a, there's a, another group, not quite as large, of drillers. And they'll interact with the data a little more, do some slicing and dicing. And then there are a few knowledge workers who really understand how to author new insights, glean new insights, visualize data to be consumed by decision makers. We need to grow this body of information consumers and have more of a distribution like this you're still going to have passive consumers. That won't go away. And you're, you're going to have drillers, but fewer of those. We need to build programs that increases the literacy of information in an organization, in a data ecosystem, so you have more knowledge workers, folks who understand how to get around a spreadsheet, how to get around a database, how to glean insights. They don't have it spoon-fed to them. They go out and investigate and find it. But in order to do that, you need data collected and, and amassed in one central place. So when we talk about analytics we like, and data governance, we like to think of it in these three, the triple aim of data governance. And, and they are data quality, data literacy, and data utilization. And, and I'm not going to go through all of those in detail. I think you'll be supplied the slides. Is that right? Yeah. So you can look at these slides. And my contact information is on the last slide. Don't hesitate to reach out with any questions. We need to move organizations 
be they in healthcare or manufacturing or retail or insurance or finance, whatever it may be, from treating data as a CYA asset, pun not intended, to a corporate asset that's treated just like bricks and mortar, like finance, like people. And that's happening certainly more in places like retail. And I've got some stories about Walmart that I don't have time to share with you, but they, they use information as a very, very strategic asset. Healthcare, not so much. Um, one of the fathers, so-called fathers of data warehousing and analytics, Ralph Kimball, said, I was at lunch with him one time, and he said, you know, there are too few unenlightened, too few enlightened CIOs who spend as much money on their IT budget getting information out and using it as they do getting information in and captured and preserved. And that is so true. Historically, IT has been all about okay, I hit the save button, the data is stored in a database, it's, got, it's backed up at the vault, I've done my job. That cannot be true in the future. A CIO and IT leaders have to spend a lot of energy and resources around leveraging that information to actually drive change in a positive direction. This is a fun slide, I'll just say in passing. I did a presentation on data governance in Oakland uh, last year. So I went out and looked for images on data governance, and I came back with countless images on data governance. This is just the first screenshot. This page goes on and on and on. We do not agree on what data governance means. Um, we have some ideas, and that's for another day's topic. Okay. So two quick stories around architecture, and then I need, to, I need to wrap up and open for questions. So if you think of a data system, we're going to wax technical a little bit here. If you think of a data system, in healthcare certainly not as big a problem in other industries, but it's a big problem in healthcare. Data is peppered throughout the organization in different systems. We have financial systems, administrative systems, e e EMR systems. EMR stands for electronic medical record systems. Patient satisfaction systems and other departmental systems, lab, pharmacy, so on and so forth. We, in order to glean insight, need those data collected and integrated into one repository. There really are three ways to do that. The first way is, let's go out, and I heard somebody, I was talking to a gentleman earlier that he took an ERD diagramming class, so hopefully this will make sense. But you build a new data model, a pristine new data model. You design a new database that has nothing to do with these systems where data is, is born. This is where the transactions occur and all the data is born in these systems. We're building a secondary system in a data warehouse that doesn't look anything like those, but we map all of those data into this new data warehouse, and we contemplate every possible information we could ever want to study, and we put it in here. In theory, this is a great approach. In practicality, in practice, it doesn't work. It's way too expensive, at least in healthcare, because the data are so incredibly complex. It just takes too much time and too much money, years, to, to do this. Another approach is let's not worry about building a, this all-encompassing data model that has every piece of information we'd ever want to study. Let's just build a database to support oncology and the work they're doing and get all the data from these sources and put it into this oncology analytical data set and build another one for Rev, revenue cycle, another one for asthma, another one for pregnancy. What we end up doing, though, is we create this, this maintenance nightmare long term that we cannot sustain and scale. The other approach that we landed on in building a data warehouse, which is baked into our platform, is let's not worry about building this all-encompassing data warehouse. Let's just pull over the data we know we need in a fairly raw form. And this is a direction for, for you tech heads in the audience that we're seeing in a big data world. The non-relational data stores like Hadoop, MapReduce, and other technologies, this is where we're going, they're going. Let's pull the data over in a fairly raw form, just get it hooked up and linked. And then we can build these 
these data sets for different populations of patients or different workflows. And we have the best of both worlds. We can link detailed data here at this level, or we can just find the, the data we need around diabetes in that, at that level. And we can build nice, nifty business intelligence um, artifacts on top of that. So we need an analytic system that integrates, that's flexible, that's adaptable, and doesn't take years to build. So remember, a best practice system, an adoption system, and a data, an analytic system. Yeah, this is a great slide. <laughs> Unleash and democratize the data. Too often we have organizations who hold it under lock and key and they don't open it up to these analysts. I'm not going to, I better uh, wrap up here. So finally, remember where we started, two thoughts. Do good with data. It's a great tool. It is not the silver bullet. Data is necessary, but it is not sufficient. You need these other, the, the interplay between these, among these three systems to really drive better outcomes and better and improvement. All right. Thank you. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Any questions? Right here. Just like to state that I thought it was really interesting that data set of from the 1800s and how accurate it was uh, in pointing out chlorine hand wash. My question is, is why do you think it took so long for people to be convinced that data sets provide reliable results? And what helped change that mindset from then to now? I don't know that I have the answer to that question. I'm, I'm befuddled and, and my, my, I'm boggled as well. But historically, physicians have, there has been a deity complex. It's a known term, a deity complex around physicians. And it's hard to tell them to do something different. And it was hard for them to accept the fact that not washing their hands was was the cause. So societal, cultural, political certainly influenced that. We have evolved over time to depend and rely more on data. So he had the data to show the changes, the empiric evidence, but he didn't have the ability to drive adoption and change. And we have better tools now and I think um, younger clinicians and even more experienced clinicians are more open. In fact, a quick story along these lines. That diabetes program that we did, the first meeting with doctors, we went in and showed them their rates of diabetics not receiving their A1C. What do you think they said? The first thing they saw is data. Data's wrong. And we worked with them in the ensuing 12 months and made them a part of, they fingerprinted the quality of the data. We went back in that same room 18 months later to start a new program around asthma and we said, we're not going to make that mistake again. We're not going to take data in this time. We're just going to go in and talk to them about what we need to do around asthma. What do you think they said then? Where's the data? So <laughs> they they will follow data. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. You need these three systems. Other hand. How, how, how much have you actually seen the best change? I mean, obviously with that group of physicians, you've, you're, or, you know, in, in certain organizations, you have a, a greater propensity to accept data. Um, how resistive do you see the world as to data even now? It's It's been a huge change in the last 20 years. When I when I started at Intermountain to today, we don't go into many off in the, into many hospitals today or work with teams of clinicians where they're 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 asking for data now. They're definitely needing data to change behavior and want to be supported by data. So it's it's been a significant change. Yep, back there.
part of it is certainly charges, but hospitals are have moved more to a charge a standard charge master. The variation in cost is preference items around supplies. One doc uses this prosthetic versus another prosthetic and and cost variation among prosthetics and supplies is unreal. So there are a lot of inputs into that variation. Um, most of it is in con is within the control of the clinical teams. Those numbers that we showed and that ability to drive to reduce variation is a real thing that we see everywhere we go. Other questions? Over here. The question was, how are we planning on integrating uh, insurance data into this, claims data? Um, we already are. So you remember that, that diagram that showed the different tuna cans around the periphery and data flowing into the data warehouse. Claims data from a payer is just another tuna can flowing in. But it adds a good piece to the puzzle. The challenge is there are issues between providers and payers that that make that limit the ability to view data across those. So there's some political and and uh, legal issues that organizations have to go through first. It's not a technical challenge at all. It's more of a legal political challenge. But those who do Intermountain Healthcare is an example that has provider data payer data and all of these other data sets into one in one repository has the panoramic view the complete picture and can influence care based on what they're seeing on the payer side so it's and vice versa it's it's really it's great good question yeah question in the back Great question. So the question is, is there a move afoot to make healthcare data more transparent? So transparency of costs. There are organizations popping up. In fact, we did a project with Stanford Healthcare where it's basically Amazon for docs. The review, Amazon reviews for docs where you can go and see their quality outcomes, their cost outcomes, there is definitely a shift toward more transparency around clinical information and outcomes and cost. And there's a shift and a push toward um, patient reported outcomes. So your data, you'll have more control over your data and its level of transparency in these vaults going forward than we have ever had in the past, which is really exciting. So definitely a shift toward more transparency. Absolutely. Other questions? Great, thank you. I think it's time for ice cream. Uh, I'm just going to give you this. This is a little token of our appreciation. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah. We're about to have our uh, ice cream social after, but uh, before that, going to do another raffle drawing and also announce the winners of the AIS showcase. Okay, guys, get your tickets ready. We'll start with the Kindle Fire. And for that, we have ticket 7263142. If you're here, come down to the stage. Yeah! Yeah, you got it. Just verify it. Okay, second, the Anchor Bluetooth speaker, and the winning ticket is 726-3118. Oh yeah, there we go. And the iPad Mini 2 is right here and 
Yeah! All right, and then now I'm going to invite uh, the AIS club real quick to come up and uh, do their award ceremony. Will all the showcase teams please come to the stage? While they're coming up, we want to thank um, Partners in Business for allowing us to have this be a part of this event. And we also wanted to thank Dr. Olson and the MIS department, as well as our judges, for their willingness to support this. And of course, we want to recognize all of our teams who were willing to put forth their ideas, and we hope you had a chance to see them. Um, in recognition of their work, we do have prizes for all of the participants. They put a lot of effort into this, and so we'll go ahead and distribute those now. Um, we have honorable mention, uh, runner-up, and the grand prize winner. And we'll start with honorable mention. This goes to Brian Bradbury, who presented on the art of tweeting, to Evan Peterson and Kyler Figgins from the mortgage company Dashboard, and congratulations to them on that. And then to our runners-up, uh, we want to acknowledge the QVC sales team, which includes Jason Rock, Patrick Redding, Daniel Swainston, and Caden Kulo. And uh, yeah, let's give them a, and then we'll, yeah, there we go. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And our, our grand prize winner goes to Mercury Location, Caleb Wilkinson. So. We hope all the students out there got some great ideas and are putting some pre um, ideas together to present next year. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.